Hey everyone, this is Three Questions with Sarah Painter. There we go. There's my people. All right. I am so pumped to have Sarah Painter. And I, I always do this. And I said, make sure I'm saying your name right. She's like, come on. <laughs> Say my name right. But I always ask just in case. You never know. I don't know if there's like, because it's Sarah with an H. You got to go Sarah. Ah. You got to <laughs> ah. You gotta add that in there too. I met Sarah. Uh, in Pinellas County and uh, with the school there, immediately connected. And I, I, I'm glad like you're just an incredible teacher, very visionary. Pinellas County is very lucky to have you. You were the Florida Teacher of the Year in 2022, which is pretty incredible, right? I, and you're talking to a guy who's never won an award for anything. <laughs> So just heads up on that. So I don't, you know, I have a lot of questions about that. Sarah's actually uh, teaching in Pinellas County, had tons of different roles, and we're going to talk a lot about, about mm -hmm. that. But I, I just want to say it is awesome. We sat and talked for a little while, and you are, you, you are like so cool in my head, and then <laughs> I meet you, and then you're 10 times cooler. So like, it's always nice to meet someone that like, you know, goes beyond your expectations. So I'm like really excited to have you on the podcast today. Awesome. I'm so excited to be here. I love connecting with you. I've been fangirling for weeks over this. So um, we're both in a good situation right now. Uh, yeah. And you and listen, you actually mentioned that you read my book yesterday. And I like, <laughs> I almost started crying. I like, <laughs> I never get sick of anyone saying that they read my book. Like, thank you so That's much for doing that. That really absolutely. meant a lot to me. So absolutely. I don't know if you're doing research. So I don't, you don't say anything stupid, but I probably will anyway. It doesn't matter what I wrote in the book. So <laughs> So Sarah, we're going to talk a lot about some of your experience. We, we have like a, a running connection, um, you know, and we'll talk about that in the other podcast. But, you know, being the teacher of the year in Florida, what, like, what an amazing accomplishment. But I, I guarantee that you've been blessed with incredible teachers, whether, and I know you mentioned some that you worked with, but I guarantee you had some. So when you think of a teacher who really inspired you, who do you think of and why? So it's so funny you ask that because I went to school in the very county that I'm working mm -hmm. in. So I moved to Pinellas County when I was seven years old as a first grader. And when I went to third grade, I had two teachers for the first time. So they were departmentalized. I have one that did reading and writing, one that did math and science. And in that same year, the one teacher that did reading and writing was um, having a baby. So she was going to have maternity leave. And the teacher that did math and science was getting married. So I had two teachers take long-term leaves during the year that I had them. But they are the most memorable teachers mm. I can think back to on my educational journey because of the relationships they built. So I am one of seven children. I am number five. That's what we do in large families. We just number yeah. ourselves. <laughs> So I was towards the end. And so these teachers had often had my siblings before yeah. me with some preconceived notions of what kind of right. student I might be or <laughs> might not be. Um, thankfully for me, the siblings ahead of me were pretty straight and narrow. So um, they already knew my family. And my mother worked in the front office as the front office clerk and did some lunchroom um, responsibilities. And my father was a custodian as well. So I don't come from a family of educators, but I come from a family that values education and right. often played a hand in what education looked like. You know, when we talk about a village, they were part of that village. So Miss Harris and Miss Valen were just these phenomenal teachers that got to know me beyond my last name and beyond my family. I remember Miss Harris had a um, treat once for us that we actually got to leave campus and go to her house for lunch. She lived very close to the school. We had permission slips. Okay. I will never forget leaving school and seeing my teacher's house. Like I, it was a palace to me, right? Like this is where my teacher lives. And I came back to school with my head held high thinking I was just something, you know, I had been to her house. And Miss ha Harris did eventually um, pass away from cancer, but Miss Valen is still friends with me to this day. She's followed my journey. We communicate on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And I just love that we have stayed connected 40 years after, you know, me walking those halls. That's amazing. We got to give a little, <laughs> little shout out to your teachers. You know, I actually, I just wrote a post. Uh, I haven't published it yet. And it, it really, you exemplify it. Because I talk about, you know, how important it is, you know, to be a teacher, but that's not the only thing you do. And, you know, you and I are having conversations and I think it actually really, when you have those well-rounded experiences outside of school, 
And a lot of kids don't realize that, you know, I'm sure you've had this too. Kids use you in the grocery store and it's, it's mind blowing. <laughs> It's like, what? you yeah. eat food? Like, you it's actually food. have to buy food? You like, replace it every right, once in a while? Right. So I think, you know, that that for me has been a, something, especially over the last few years, is really kind of making sure that it is important for me to focus on those things that have nothing to do with education. And somehow, focusing on them has made me a better educator because I actually, you know, connect a lot of those things. So, so I love that you mentioned some of their personal experiences and how they resonate with you because... We always talk about building relationships with our students and part of that is they have to know who you are as well so i i really really appreciate that and your parents story is amazing i i think that is so crucial and you know my parents you know weren't teachers but they valued education the same way and, and you know it's so cool they worked uh, in the community now you and i have had lots of conversations about really great leaders that you've had um i know i know your superintendent i you're a superintendent by the way uh is it it's kevin hendrick right kevin hendrick, yeah so there is no person, I'm talking anybody who pops up on my Twitter <laughs> more than Kevin Hendrick, who's your superintendent. And he, like, he, I, I feel the pride. I'm just, just so you know, if you ever talk to him, just say I, I look up to him, but he doesn't follow me back on Twitter. I'm just giving you that. I, I'll, up, match right? so I, just, I know. I'll match him. I know. I'll match him. Just give him a little hard time about it. But like, uh, amazing, amazing uh, stuff and just so much pride. And I think when you share those things, it, it really, promotes more people mm -hmm. doing those things. It's not just about like highlighting, but it's actually spreading that, making, you know, great stuff go viral in your school district. So I know you've you've been blessed to have really great administrators, but when you when you think of that, who's like a really great administrator you had and, and why and why do you think that? Yeah, it's really hard to choose here because I've had so many amazing administrators, both principals and assistant principals, but I can't help but not talk about um my former principal, Antoinette Wilson, she's still a principal in my district, but not at my school anymore. Um, she was our fearless leader for 10 years. And in Pinellas County, that's very rare to keep a principal at one school for 10 years. But I think what set Antoinette apart from other leaders I've had was her um, transparency. So she didn't ever claim to be the best at anything. She would humbly admit when she was leading a PLC on a topic that she wasn't an expert right. in, but she was really good at calling the experts in. And they were usually in the room, us teachers. So I felt like she kind of did that mentality of the smartest person in the room is the room itself. And she would name people in the room to be the voice for these topics that she admittedly hadn't been interacting with for years. And so she made you feel smart. And there's nothing better than feeling like you're super smart. And so that's what I loved about Antoinette. But she also had like this autonomy with her teachers where if you had an idea that was innovative or different, you just had to present a plan to her and she would let you go try it. So even if it wasn't something that was scheduled or predicted, if you just said, hey, I really wanna try this and you sold it as why it was good for kids, mm -hmm. she'd give you the green light. And you don't get to see that all the time in administrators. Did I get, did I get to meet her? Did I get to no, meet her? No, I haven't met her. All right, no. so like, we just gotta meet, we gotta meet everybody. Nobody here. You know what's funny? As you're telling me this, uh, I had a little bit of a moment. I don't, I don't, did you see the little tail? <laughs> My dog, who is the smartest dog in the world, can open the door and he opened the door and uh, came into the office. And so he's listening to your story too. Yeah, there it is. So, so yeah. So anyways, that, that was there too. So I was like, oh no, this is seriously happening. Do you remember the, the guy during COVID where his kid oh, came in? Oh my God, I'm having this moment right now. All right. So we'll, we'll get him back here. Suggs, oh. Suggs will be on the podcast one day. So okay. you didn't want to put him on. He, you know, he got fixed yesterday and, uh, so wearing a little cone, having a rough day. So you just need a little extra love. You know, it's funny when you talked about um, your principal, you, when you're a teacher, sometimes you think that your principal knows everything. And then honestly, like I used to think that, and then I became a principal I'm like, Oh God, no, <laughs> I don't. How are this oh, no, no. If that's the, then I'm not suiting for this, but then you realize like they're really the best principals and you and I are having this conversation before. Mm -hmm. I think that really, if I, I, I shared this too, it, is that I, I fully admit I have an ego. I want to do well. I want to excel in everything I do. If you're really effective in your role, 
uh, in leadership, you actually, your ego will lead to getting everyone else to do better. And that mm -hmm. to me is really, really crucial. Whereas sometimes insecurity, which is, you know, disguises ego will be like, I don't want anyone to be better than me. And right. that's really, you know, you want people to have, you know, be a part of their trajectory. You're not like making a person or making a break. Well, you can break them to be honest. Yeah. So uh, I think <laughs> it's really important to, to like be a part of that journey. And that's something that it's like, you can still have an ego. You can still want to do really, really well. But in leadership, you know, as you talked about your principle, others doing well, actually, it also will feed your ego a little bit too, right? right? So I think that, I know that sounds like nobody talks about that, but mm -hmm. it's true, it's true. Like I wanna do well. Of course I wanna do well in my roles and hopefully that's part of it. So I know you've been teaching um, for, you said this is year 21 for you. 22, uh, this is year 22. It's year 22, right? So you like, mm -hmm. you actually, 2000, did you start? Uh, 2003. 2003, okay. Oh yeah. no, oh no. Not, not you didn't teach in the, in the 1900s <laughs> like me you just start teaching in the 1900s that's a oh. new thing oh yeah i love when people bring that up all right so so you've been teaching 22 years obviously i i can't do math so it's been a while for me uh when you go back to your very first year you teaching what what's up what is the advice you'd give to your first year teacher self yeah it's funny you mentioned that ego thing because i i think that can be confused with confidence sometimes. So I would say to my first year teacher self to be confident, but get out of your own way. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not about you. And I think that first year it was about me. And I've, I've listened to some of your podcasts about decorating the classroom, right? It was about what I wanted the walls Contro to look very like. Controversial. I know, very controversial. I know. I'm already stretching it right here. <laughs> um, so it was about me. It was what I wanted my classroom to look like. Right. It was the way I envisioned the lesson. It was the outcome I was looking for. And so I think I would go back and tell myself, get out of the way. Right. And, and you do that by sharing the ownership in your classroom. And, and that's by handing the learning over. You know, I've often heard who whoever is um, doing the majority of the talking is doing the majority of the learning. I was doing the majority of the talking probably my first 10 years. I was sage on a stage. Mm -hmm. I was lecturing. I was, and I, and I was good. I got good results, but was it life changing? Was it anything right. that those children remember today? Probably not. So I would just say, get out of your own way, share the ownership to where you build a culture where the children are inquisitive that inquiry is part of your classroom they can question things and you don't take it as a shot to your ego you know in, in innovators mindset i actually talked a little bit about this because we have like so many you know commonalities here i think i actually and i'm pretty sure this is an innovators mindset i i wrote that basically my first year teaching i would say to the kids you will learn the way i teach like yep. this is what you're doing yeah and then i started to realize it's really important for me to adjust the kids not the kids to adjust to me yes you know, like as you're talking about that i like i also have a little empathy for myself at that time because you are you really don't know a lot of stuff and right. the, you know the more you don't know the more you try to control right, right. And you try to control every movement because you're like there's a little insecurity there so you know it's hard to, to do that but you know it i remember in my second year uh, the t students were like coming back to my class. They're like, Mr. Kuros, we miss you so much. Like you were just awesome. And this new teacher is like making us, you know, we could just listen to your stories all day and you talk all the time. And now this new teacher is like making us, you know, think for ourselves and, <laughs> and <laughs> do stuff. And I'm like, oh God. And I, at the time I thought, oh yeah, like that would suck. And then I was like, yeah. oh my God, like I probably caused more issues than I solved then, right? Because yeah. te that teacher's actually what to do what they're supposed to be doing. And it was like, yeah, oh, I, like me I being think one thing, it just kind of came to me as you were saying that is, is being okay with coaching. Mm -hmm. I always thought in those first 10 years that if an, an instructional coach or academic coach was in my room, it was because I was doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. So I did not have the lens or the mindset of everybody needs coaching. I know there's a quote in your book by Dylan William, and that is yeah. one of my favorite, favorite ones. But I think that just happened recently. And like I, you said, I'm in year 22. I would say a few years ago, I was working on my pacing of my lessons because I realized I was teaching for long periods of time and not handing the learning over. So I started using a timer and I tried to get my core lesson down to 10 minutes before I would let oh. them go interact. And I told my students, I'm using this timer today 
because I'm trying to get better at shortening my lessons. So when you hear it go off, blah, 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 blah. But that was shared responsibility now. It wasn't just me. That's I was awesome. modeling that I was being coached and I was modeling that I was working on this and they were holding me accountable because the timer could easily go off and I'd be like, ignore, <laughs> keep going. But they're like, Miss Painter, don't forget you're working on getting your lesson uh, done. It's to take over, right? So I think I yeah. would say be open to coaching and actually seek it because we all get better when we allow another set of eyes to see our profession. Wow. Who better give that advice than the 2022 <laughs> teacher of the year in Florida. So, Hey, everyone, Sarah, you're awesome. I cannot wait to talk to you more. I really hope a ton of people listen to this podcast. will connect with you. Uh, and I, I look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be reading your book one day. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Okay. I know, I know your, yours was thrown on the universe, but I am thrown on the universe too. So I, I can't wait for it. So everyone make sure you connect with Sarah. Sarah, thanks so much. I can't wait to talk to you more.